name is Tracy Smith. I'm the author of Faithful Families, Creating Sacred Moments at Home. And this conversation is sort of a selfish one. I wanted to get together with my friends. And <laughs> so I thought that since we're getting together, we might as well uh, record. We've just had a fun time chatting and catching up. And this group in my calendar, it's uh, the Mon Ami Friends Group. And the reason <laughs> that it's the Mon Ami Friends Group is that um, we meet together when it's not a pandemic at <laughs> Mon Ami French Restaurant and get together and share stories about faith and life and friends. All of us have um, some things in common and some things that are very different. We're all parents and we all write at some times uh, about faith and about family. So I thought uh, I'd introduce us and maybe how we how we know each other really quickly before we get going. Um, Glennis, you I think are the middle spoke in the wheel of our friendship. Uh, I met <laughs> Glennis through the wonder of the internet in 2014 when my first book uh, was called Seamless Faith came out and had her first book out, which she's going to talk about. And I just contacted you and said, I think we're kindred spirits. Can we work together? And then we became internet friends. And then when I moved to Elmhurst, where I live now, you sent me a Facebook message and said, there's this woman that you need to know. Her name is Karen. And uh, I remember this first Facebook conversation I had with Karen. I was like, oh my gosh, we went to the same college. And they were like, oh my gosh, we both live in Elmhurst. Oh my gosh, we both have la Latino husbands. Oh my gosh, we both speak Spanish. Like there was all of these connections. And then through Karen, you said, you know, there's this other friend that I have. And we are really actual true friends, not... <laughs> acquaintances acquaintances named Jennifer and that's how I got to know you Jennifer um, so Karen is uh, the author of grit and grace heroic women of the Bible and a bunch of other ones and Jennifer Grant I think my people know you most through your book maybe God is like that too uh, my people want us know all of your books so you're <laughs> okay so to get the ball rolling I thought um, you know I think we've all had this experience of being together with friends and somebody tells a story and everybody just puts down their bread basket and is just listening to it and that was a story Glennis that you told the first time we got together at Mon Ami and it's the story of how your first book Love Letters um, to God came to be so I want to turn it over to you and like I said to, to everybody at the beginning we're not really um in a rush. So if you're, if, if you're looking for a quick uh, conversation, you should probably come back when you have time. We're <laughs> take our time and chat. Um, so tell us all the juicy details about that book, and how it came to be. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tracy. And I just can't wait for us all to be back at our little French restaurant. <laughs> I, I, I miss it so much. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me to share about this. Um, my first baby, you know, <laughs> this special book. And I mean, it's special for a number of reasons, but really I just thought this would be the only book I would ever write. You know, I'm like, when this was published, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I did it, you know. <laughs> oh, I, I'm an author, how crazy is that? And uh, I never dreamed that this would turn into a series and then I'd be able to write more and more books for children. So. It's, it's, it is an amazing story of how it came to be. So really the story of it begins a long time ago in the 1980s when my children were born. And um, I was a teacher in England before we came to the United States. And I love, this was our, my favorite book in the classroom. <laughs> and it was our, children's favorite book my my four kids and this is my ancient 1984 copy you can see it's got a tea stain <laughs> yes. it's very british of you oh us. yes it's not <laughs> coffee it's it's tea right there but um when we came to the united states 20 years ago we came a family of six we came with uh 20 boxes that was it so we had to bring what was precious you know i remember saying to my kids you have one big box take what is precious and this was one of our precious things and um 
it's just this book was the inspiration beho- behind love letters from god and it's just amazing to me how this was so long ago in my life but how how god brings things um back around you know that 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 you can use anyway this just um iconic book the jolly postman written by a husband and wife team and it was um innovative for its time because it's the story of a little postman who rides his bike delivering letters to nursery rhyme characters um and i'm going to show you the innovative thing i mean it's brilliantly written in rhyme but that's not what makes the book but before i show you i just have to how precious is this i don't know if you can read that but it says to gar to gareth that's my youngest son on your sixth birthday with love from james so that that's my uh, two youngest sons so anyway what makes it innovative is that the the pages are real envelopes that have letters inside um so my kids i can just remember they would love this interactive feature of the text so they would pull the letter out and open it and read it and um they just loved participating in the book and the personalized nature and so uh, that one the first one is addressed to mr and mrs bear three bears cottage the woods it's an apology <laughs> note from goldilocks <laughs> you know, for for eating their porridge so how creative and inventive and so it's got like eight real letters in um so anyway that was an iconic book from our childhood when we came to the states i was writing curriculum for my sunday school teachers i stepped out of public schools and was a christian ed director and curriculum was way too expensive so i started writing bible stories for my teachers to share with the kids and that's what gave me the inspiration i thought i'm i'm going to write a storybook bible and i remember saying to david my husband i i, I think i'm going to write a storybook bible and and i'm going to get it published by zonda kids <laughs> and he's that. and he's david's like that's great you can do that you know you go for it and um he was very encouraging i know he was thinking about his retirement but <laughs> but he he really encouraged me and so I knew I had to have a good idea right because there was you know there's so many good bible story books out there and that's when I felt as if as if god whispered to me glennis do you remember the jolly postman mm. do you remember the letters why don't you write bible stories with letters from me you know fr- from god so i felt like i had something uh, original and i got started i loved it it was like i felt i really felt like the holy spirit wrote through my pen you know i'd write the stories i'd write the letters and i'm like this is going to be so good <laughs> and then halfway through i quit and i just i don't know just one day i you know you get that tap on your shoulder that says what are you doing mm-hmm. you you really think you're going to publish a book are you nuts <laughs> mm-hmm. uh you're not good enough you you mm-hmm. can't do it forget it and um it's hard not to listen to that voice and so i quit and it was halfway done and i just put it on the shelf and my husband bless him because i wouldn't mm-hmm. be an author without him one day it was like but it sat there gathering dust maybe for about a year mm-hmm. and then my husband came and he said where's your book and i said what what book and he said don't be silly that book you're writing with the letters <laughs> where is it and i said oh david it, you know that's just a dream that's a crazy silly wasting and wasting my time um mm-hmm. i quit and he said what do you mean why would you quit halfway through and i said i just i'll never get it published and so then david asked me three questions that changed my life um and i always pass these on to other writers because i think it's such a common uh feeling that we're not good enough you know 
So anyway, the first one he asked me, he said, Glennis, do you believe that God called you to write that book? And I said, yes, that was easy because I always felt like the inspiration came from God. And then um, the second question, he said, okay, so if God called you to write that book, do you think God wants you to finish it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not answering that, you know, because <laughs> don't you hate it when your spouse is right, you know? <laughs> but I knew he was right. But it was the third question that really pushed me to finish it. He said, Glennis, just think for a minute. What would have happened if Noah had only built half a boat? <laughs> <laughs> And it was silly, you know, and in my mind, I could see this half, half a vessel with all the animals falling off, you know. <laughs> but I knew that um, I had to do my part. I had to finish that book and then see. Because even God, as great as God is, God cannot publish half a book. Zonda kids cannot publish half a book. And, and so when people ask me, do you think, it was God's plan for your life, you know, that you wrote this book. I say yes, but it could easily never have come to be. I think, yes, God has plans for us, but we have to work hand in hand with God. We have to work hard and do our part. Um, so anyway, I pick the book up. But yeah, but I just want to add this though. But I do think about all those half written manuscripts, you know, sitting on hope robbed shelves and, and how you must finish what God calls you to, mm -hmm. whatever God's calling you to, you must finish it, you know, yeah. like Jesus did, it is finished, you know, anyway, um, that's my sermon. <laughs> so I, so I finished the book. I'm like, okay, I'm going to finish it. And then it's like, that was fun. That was great. How, how on earth do I get this baby published? So, you know, like many fledgling authors, I sent it to a bunch of publishers and never heard a thing. <laughs> um, not surprisingly. And I knew that I had to have either an agent or I had to attend a writer's conference. Mm -hmm. I didn't want an agent because I wanted to do it myself. <laughs> um, I didn't want to go to a writer's conference either, actually, <laughs> but I knew I had to. So I took the plunge and I registered and I went and I was really well prepared. I, I had my, man, my whole manuscript and my proposal fully edited professionally. It was in a lovely little presentation folder. I also had a little mock-up of the book because my brother is a brilliant writer, he actually lives in Hong Kong. He said, Glenish, you have to do a mock-up. And I'm like, no, 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 because for children's books, you just write it. You don't have anything to do with the illustrations. And he said, no, just give them a visual of the letters, mm -hmm. the letters in the envelopes. And so that made sense. So I had a little mock-up. My friend helped me make it with clip art. And she even made cute little, I was looking for it before, but I don't know where it is. She made cute little envelopes, real envelopes with the real letters that you mm -hmm. took out. <laughs> you know, from God. And so I was really well prepared. I signed up, I did all my research. I signed up with a 15 minute time or 10 minute time slot with the Zonda kids <laughs> representative. And I went to my very first writers conference and I thought I was so well rehearsed. I was prepared. I was ready, you know, and when I go in the room, it's like all of a sudden, my knees were jelly. I was shaking. I'm thinking, oh, now what was I, what was I supposed to say, you know? <laughs> and so I sat down and she was super nice. And when I opened my, I opened my mouth and this is what came out. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, that's like a mouse living inside me or something. I'm like, <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. But literally, my voice was crazy weird, high pitched. I was like, <laughs> I had my, my, my proposal thing and it, it was all like, woo, dither, dither. <laughs> and I said, my, my, my name's Glennis. I've written this book. 
like um, it's it, it's got letters. It's Bible stories with letters, and I'm thinking, and she's looking at me like <laughs> she's not well prepared. But I was well prepared. <laughs> but I was just so nervous. So anyway, I thought, right, the verbal's not going well. Go with the visual. Mm -hmm. So I pulled out the little mock up that my brother said me, and I, I I said, look, 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 it's it's. This is Bible stories and look, it's got real envelopes and you can, there's letters inside and my hands were shaking so much I couldn't even get the letter out. I was going, <laughs> 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 I remember it as clear as day. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and then I just stopped talking and I thought, oh my goodness, just give her the mock up and quit talking, you know. Yeah. Well, she took it from me and she opened it and she looked at it. And do you know what she said? No. She said, this is like the Jolly Postman. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It was just like, it was just such a Holy Spirit moment. It was mm -hmm. like God stepped in the room and all of a sudden, I mean, this is a lady. We were sitting, oh, she, I said, you know, the, you know, the Jolly Postman. And she said, oh, yes, it was my kid's favorite book when they were little. And so all of a sudden, all the nerves went and then we and we had a connection. And um, it was just wonderful to me that I was in England. She was in America. We both had kids and they both read the same book. And here I am 30 years later. Yeah. Uh, and so. God was absolutely part of that journey and I had to wait a whole year before I heard back from Zonda Kids because the whole idea of the letters was very expensive for them mm -hmm. and they had to work out the financing but mm -hmm. that's how it all started for me and mm -hmm. so this book it's got 18 Bible stories and they've all got lit and they are lift the flat love letters actually and I was a bit disappointed about that at first. I don't know if you can see, but they just mm -hmm. lift. And you can put the child's name in the letter. But um, they were so smart because they said, let's not do envelopes with letters that they can lose. Yeah. You know, we're going we're gonna to do a lift the flat. So mm -hmm. anyway, that was um, just an amazing journey for me and, uh, mm -hmm. and how God was woven in all the details. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Thanks. So, Holy that. Spirit moment. And I think that's mm -hmm. a theme that uh, runs through so much of our work and writing and mm -hmm. all the time. And yeah. So uh, thank you, Glennis. It was just a, yeah. a second time. And <laughs> <laughs> so, Karin, one of the things I remember about uh, the first time that I met you in person after we had our Facebook, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right. was feeling incredibly nervous because I just moved to this new town, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. you get to make friends, but then it's like, I think making friends as an adult sometimes can be really hard. You oh, know, yeah. like, oh, do you like, do you say, like, and when you're like, do you like, do you like me? Check. Yeah. Uh, and What's so the roses are very, <laughs> like, you know, I just thought like, oh man, I don't want to blow it. Like, not only is this somebody that I have a lot in common with, but somebody whose work I knew, know and respect. Uh, at the time, I only knew about the book I asked, I'm going to ask you to talk about in a second. But, um, but I just remember you being so normal and real and nice. And just, we talked about parenting and the town that we live in and some of the funny things about that and I'm sure we even talked about the Holy Spirit although I don't remember uh, I do remember <laughs> like, it's funny what you remember like I re when you're feeling self-conscious or awkward I remember ordering this flatbread thing mm -hmm. at the that we were at that was like so crackly it was like a <laughs> cracker and I remember eating it and like little bits of the cracker yeah falling off and then I was like oh my gosh this is so embarrassing like she's gonna think I don't know how to eat like <laughs> I'm guessing you don't remember that I'm guessing you weren't like walking away I don't that woman doesn't actually know. Karen talks about that all the time exactly I remember it was like in my shirt and I was like trying to get the crumbs out of my shirt it was like, anyway I don't recommend the flatbed bread at the place that we had that. okay um but oh, so, so <laughs> the story, the other thing that you said to me that I said I was going to mention on this call 
that I didn't know until we had that first uh, lunch meeting that before your career, right before you wrote uh, for children, you wrote for adults. And you were telling me that when you go to parties, you say that you write for grown-ups and children because if you say you write adult nonfiction, people get <laughs> something else. So you can, you know, Glennis sort of took us on her journey of her first book. You can take it any way you want to go selfishly. Okay. I would love it if you talked at some point about um, Grit and Grace just because that's the one that I'm selfishly most curious about. Like, okay. how did you decide and tell people about it in case they don't know? So. Okay. Yeah, and just about the saying I write for grown-ups instead of adults. <laughs> it was just a bad experience at a neighbor's party where I was talking to a neighbor's dad oh. all things, and the neighbor was there. And I said, like, I write, I don't even know how it came out, but using the word like, you know, adult, and mostly I write adult nonfiction, non fiction. <laughs> but he, no kidding, if your kids are watching, maybe just pause it or need it a second. But he said, oh, like erotica? <laughs> and my, I just about died because I mean, it was, I'm laughing so hard. My poor neighbor, just imagine if your dad asked somebody that. And it was just, but in that moment, I was like, okay, we're calling it grown ups. So I'm gonna, <laughs> so anyway, so that's where that went. Uh, yeah, so Grit and Grace um, was kind of an out of nowhere. Um, book too. I believe I had written um, like on spec the story of Noah's Ark for um, what is now Beaming Books, which was called Spark House Family at the time. Um, I, so I believe I had already done that book, but I was actually at the uh, Calvin College, Calvin University now, Festival Ooh, of that's Writing. <laughs> yeah, <woo. laughs> um, and I was working on an article um, at the time, and it was an article on... Uh, Oh, because it was for a Catholic publication. I believe it was like the, the meanings or, or it was something really, really simple, like best mm -hmm. Bible names for girls or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I was up really early in the morning at the hotel desk and I'm literally flipping through the Bible, you know, instead of Googling prettiest Bible names or whatever. And for this article, and just as I'm looking through, you know, page after page after page, there was just something that happened when you, you know, literally I'm just scanning, looking for stories about women and I just thought, my goodness, you know, I don't, I don't even know so many of these stories and, um, and knowing whatever, there's something, something hit me that I, I thought I wanted to do, you know, explore it a little bit and write about it. And my first thought was, of course, to write it for grownups. Um, but I was actually um, with a friend of mine not long after, uh, Carla Barnhill, who worked for Spark House at the time, which is now Beaming. And I just talked to her a little bit about the book and she's like, no, I think that'd be really great for kids to develop that. And so I did, I just sort of followed this path and mm -hmm. um, it was tricky though. It was tricky picking um, who to write about. Mm -hmm. um, and it, my first thought was to kind of write the more obscure stories. But as I looked at the, the books that were currently out about women of the Bible, you know, there's this prevailing theme that many of us have run into and it's gotten much, much better. But a lot of these books, you know, really take the princess angle. They really take the mm, Esther mm -hmm. was in a beauty pageant and it was mm -hmm. so fun um, <laughs> to spend six months, you know, getting beauty treatments and how every girl wanted <laughs> to have that happen. And um, so what I ended up doing was actually choosing some of the more um, known stories, um, Ruth and Naomi, Esther, Mary, mm -hmm. um, but trying to tell them at a kid appropriate level, it's, it's middle grades, so maybe eight to 12, um, tell them in a, a more honest, um, mm -hmm. or at least from my perspective, it was a more honest telling, a more realistic mm -hmm. view of what it really would have been like. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I did. And um, a lot of the stories were really, really, really fun to write. And it was great to sort of research and get some background, you know, information just on what life would have been like for these women and girls. Mm -hmm. um, really tapping into how brave, you know, some of these women and girls were like, just, I don't know, you know, even the story of the bleeding woman. I mean, mm -hmm. it's such a tiny little story in scripture, but my goodness, this woman who was unclean, unclean, hadn't been around people in years moving her way through a crowd um, just to reach out and touch Jesus. I mean, that she could have been in big, big trouble for doing that, you know? Yes. And um, yeah. 
so really wanting to tap into that. And um, yeah, so that's, that's what I did. Um, yeah, it was super fun to write. Some of the stories were really, really hard to write. Um, I remember getting to Mary, mother of Jesus, and being like, oh, because I was writing, I wrote them in first person, like as mm -hmm. if they were telling the stories. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of easy to tap into, you know, uh, I don't know, even Queen Esther, someone like that. Mm -hmm. Eve was a trickier one to tap into for a lot of reasons. But <laughs> I remember getting to Mary um, and being like, okay, this feels like this might be a little too gutsy, you know, to, to tap into something like, oh, and now I will be Mary. But, you know, that seems <laughs> a little um, But when I ended up doing that with that was just, you know, the motherhood angle. And when mm -hmm. we're all moms, I mean, so just kind of going into that place of, oh my goodness, can you imagine if your child, you know, was the Messiah, <laughs> you know, not mm -hmm. even that, but just the destiny, you know, everything that awaited him and, and going into that place, um, it was actually kind of a very um, spiritual time for me too, mm -hmm. because just connecting on that level of, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, you know, we revere Mary and Mary's so wonderful, but what a, what a task, what a thing God asked her to do. I mean, that yeah. was, you know, her obedience is, is unbelievable. Well, it's a, such a great book. And I think you kind of made reference to this. I think one of the things that really stood out to me is the age that it's for. I think there's, there's little women of the Bible cutesy things, mm -hmm. for the littles, and then things that are maybe Bible studies for grown women, but this mm -hmm. little grade, right when you're at an age, I think where you're, a lot of girls are starting to really move from that age where you're like a child and you're kind of fearless and then mm -hmm. you're being a little awkward or you're starting mm -hmm. to learn these narratives about things that girls can and can't do. And then that's right when that book um, hits them. So is that, is Grit and Grace the first, was it your first children's book? That's what I was trying to figure out. I think I had the Noah's Ark one before, but that okay. was a picture yeah. book. Uh -huh. You know, obviously very different, although an incredibly difficult story too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Working on that was like a Noah's Ark is, yeah. you know, not much of a kid's story. But anyway, um, yeah, so that was my, my first one though. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the first um, book that Sparkhouse did, which is now Beamy Books, um, their first regular contracted book too. Everything mm -hmm. else they had done up until that point had been work for hire. So it was kind of cool in that you know now they have yeah. this amazing catalog of stuff but i got to be the guinea pig. oh here's the first one. Oh, that's neat yeah okay. the first sort of i don't know what it's called the regular non work for hire book yeah cool karen i i wanted to ask you i love that book grit and grace i remember getting like a preview copy uh -huh. copy to review on my blog and what i absolutely love is the first person mm -hmm. you know because it invites children and well young girls to step into the shoes of those women. Mm -hmm. um, so what made you write it in first person? Did, was that your idea from the beginning or? I went back and forth and a lot of the stories were written in both because I couldn't decide. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I feel like exactly what you said. It was, it was more of an invitation than to step in and really sort of like your love letters, like you're, you're actually being spoken to by these women. And mm -hmm. when I go and talk about the book um, and I do talk about it more, you know, to groups of um, girls that age, although I have some amazing stories from parents of boys who have loved it too, because it's important for boys, awesome. obviously, to know. Um, yeah. But that's something I do always encourage kids, boys or girls is, that it's okay to, to really put yourself in the story and imagine everything around it. You know, that's what's so wonderful about the Bible. Um, you know, some of the details are very sparse and it's okay to use our imaginations or wonder or yeah, put yourself in it and, and think, what would this have been like? Cause otherwise yeah. the temptation I think is to just read through stories very quickly. Like it's no big deal or like, yeah, that was no big thing. And um, yeah, so that was kind of part of it. But yeah, there was some back and forth of what was the best way to write it, for sure. Well, I love it. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen, thank you. so much. So Jennifer, you're last, but you're not mm -hmm. least. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jennifer, oh, what can I say about you? So I got to know you last of the three. And uh, so I was less nervous to meet you because uh, Karen gave you uh, a very nice recommendation. 
Thank you, Karen. Weren't scary. Should have made you seem scarier. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at her wrong. Very intimidating. Um, but you and I hit it off on the first time that we met too, which was uh, amazing. And I, I tell people now sometimes, uh, I don't mention you by name, but now I'm about to, they're going to know that it's you. Sometimes I <laughs> refer to you as like my, my fairy writing uh, mentor friend. You have a lot of wisdom about uh, writing and the writing process. And um, I've learned so, so, so much from you. And you, like everybody except me on this call, <laughs> you've written and published a ton of things. You've had a long uh, career of writing for grownups and for kids. And so I, I'm asking you to slide in at the, at the kind of present day to talk about a book in part again, because I liked the story and I think people will like to hear it. I think um, we're recording this on August 1st, which is quote, we're in the middle of COVID time. And um, the topic of the book that I'm, I want you to talk about is A Little Blue Bottle and it's about grief. And I think, um, you know, all of us right now are going through grief of some kind, whether it's somebody that's lost or a grief um, related to a circumstance. And um, as parents, I don't know who's listening, but a lot of parents I'm imagining, um, we need resources that talk about grief. So, and I think talking about grief in a way that's unique or connectional is, is hard. So I'm curious about the origin story of um, Little Blue Bottle. Before I, before you get to it, I want to tell you this, all this quote I heard one time that said something like, writers never ask each other where they got the idea from <laughs> something because they all know that they don't know. <laughs> as yeah. as faith-based writers. I think that's mm -hmm. true. I think we've talked about this before. So I'm not I'm not asking you to tell where you the idea because you know, but I'm curious about the Holy Spirit in this process and how it came to be. And then also you've shared some really interesting information about your relationship with the illustrator, which is not a super common way that children's books are put together. So I thought you could tell us that story too. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I I don't know how far back you want me to go, but as far um, as you want. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, years ago, um, a friend, actually a mutual friend of Karen's and, and mine, whose name is Amy Julia Becker, um, lives in Connecticut. And, um, after the Sandy Hook shootings, her young children had to go to a number of funerals for the children, uh, who had been killed in their school. Mm -hmm. And, I, we were um, Amy Julie and I were talking one time and I, I said, are there good picture books or books for young children that, um, that you found that have been helpful? And she said she really hadn't found a lot of resources. And then I started kind of poking around on the internet, looking at books about grief for children. And um, so I had this kind of idea or nugget of an idea that I would like someday to write about grief for children um, because obviously kids, sometimes as, as not only writers, but readers, we sort of can fall into the temptation of, um, idealizing what children go through. I think mm. probably not right now. I mean, um, as you said, like we're in the middle of this COVID situation, probably a lot of parents are mindful that children are not sort of skipping along and, you know, <laughs> skimming stones at the, at the lake and, you know, they, that they have a lot of loss and disappointment and, and grief that is just as real as those uh, griefs that, and disappointments that we have as adults. So anyway, so I kind of had it in my mind. And, um, and then I started reflecting pro a couple of years ago about the older women that have been important in my life and in my kids' lives in the neighborhood. And so uh, when I was growing up, the main character in this story in a little blue bottle um, who has died is named Mrs. Wednesday. And I had a Mrs. Wednesday who lived, who's an old lady. And um, her house was on my route walking home from elementary school. And of course, <laughs> things have changed since, you know, the seventies when I was walking home from school and she would, you know, wave to me and I'd sit on her. I didn't know her at all. I don't think my family knew her. Um, and it was probably a mile away from my, my house. And uh, she would give me, you know, like lemonade and we'd sit on her porch and chat. And um, she was just a very loving, 
kind of presence and would wave to me. And, um, and it's funny, I don't think I even ever mentioned to my mom if I <laughs> had a visit with her. I mean, it's very, it was a very different time, right? But um, anyway, she once actually gave me a beautiful antique little doll that was a beautiful uh, keepsake kind of doll. Anyway, um, so I thought about her and, and then in my own children's lives, we've always had neighbors uh, in, in our first home when my oldest, there was an old woman named Dot and Dot used to invite my son Theo over when he was, you know, three and four years old and sit with him. And it always reminded me of that relationship that I had with this Mrs. Wednesday. And then we had a neighbor named Helen in our next house that would invite my kids over. And so this character of Mrs. Wednesday, whom the little girl is remembering, who's, who's died, the woman has died. Um, some of the things that the two do together are things that I did with the real Mrs. Wednesday or that my kids did with, with mm -hmm. Dot or Helen. And I think those intergenerational friendships can be um, mm -hmm. such a comfort, you know, to kids and a different, they add, you know, the wisdom and the, um, and the time that an older person might have that a mom, a busy mom might not have, um, just to really look at the child and acknowledge them. And so I was trying to capture that in this story too, just the way that this little girl felt really seen and really loved by this woman and felt at home in her home. And then um, the kind of uh, theme of grief is just, I wanted to almost in a way model in this story, how we can be with people who are grieving, not only children, but our friends who are grieving, um, just by listening to them, not by giving them, you know, sort of directives about how to handle their grief or how to um, express it, but just letting them be with it. Mm -hmm. So um, the mom in this story who is interacting with her daughter about this loss doesn't tell her what to think about it. She doesn't put platitudes around it and she doesn't say you know well she's in a better place now or mm -hmm. well god knows what you know god is doing and and so on you know it's it's really kind of a um an invitation to kind of allow children to be where they really are in their mm -hmm. grief and uh and then the the image of the little blue bottle is just i do the um the character mrs wednesday has told the mom of this little girl that she has a little blue bottle and she when she's feeling sad she reflects on whether god collects there's a verse in the psalms that says that god collects our tears in a bottle and so that is kind of a symbol to her that god is with her when she is um suffering so anyway it's a kind of it's a very quiet book it's um it was it's always important to me in my work for kids that when i'm writing about god um, I'm not being kind of, I hope I'm not sort of forcing them into a way to think about spiritual things, but kind of giving like a, you know, non-gendered, I never refer to God as he, you know, and I don't, um, I don't sort of tell them what to think or what, uh, what their responsibility is and all this, but more sort of invite them to reflect on where do I see God in the world or is God with me when I'm suffering and so on. And so that book is sort of thematically um, similar in that way. Um, and then at the end of it, there is a page, uh, the publisher asked me to create a page of best pra practices for adults to use when they're trying to help a child who's grieving. And so I wrote them and then I'm, you know, as I'm not a psychologist and uh, I just really wanted that list of best practices to be helpful and accurate. So. I think I sent it to 24 different people who work with children so that they could kind of vet it and say, yeah, this, or you forgot this or whatever. So there, I, I think it's a very helpful um, resource in terms of kids grieving. And I, I also didn't want to do anything to, I don't want to re-traumatize a child who's lost someone. So I think the fact that it's an older person and a neighbor and not a parent or a friend, um, and it's not a traumatic or violent situation. It's, it's just this person has died. Um, so, you know, so I had a lot of thought in planning the book and then uh, a lot of joy really in writing it and in honoring those friendships that I've had and that my kids have had with older neighbors. So, um, yeah.
that's kind of the that's the long version, I guess. Love it. I think people appreciate the long version. So I, <laughs> that's the thing about this conversation. Even if zero people listen to it, <laughs> it's fun to have. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to have anyway. yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, I was I was going to ask before we started recording because I don't know who who among us has the oldest child. Is that you, Glennis? How old is well, your well? Probably my eldest. He was born in 84, and I'm no good at maths, so what's that, 36? Ask a bunch of writers. <gasps> right. Wow. 30, is he, whatever. Is he, um, he's in his 30s. Yes, and so... I, actually, I have four, and they're all in the 30s, so there you go. <laughs> so, and, then, <laughs> yeah. and I think I have the youngest at three and a half, um, with Marina. So we have children from three and a half all the way uh, into adulthood and then you have grandchildren. And I think one of the things that uh, people that may be listening sometimes uh, might be interested in, at least people ask me all the time, is like how do, um, how as writers for children around faith-based things, you kind of touched on this, everybody did a little bit, like, um, but how have we used either our own work or somebody else's work in that faith formation at home. So how have we, how have we seen our own? And sometimes I think for me, one of the things that, <laughs> this is a little tangent, but I'm getting somewhere. So do, do you see the movie Legally Blonde? Um, so there's this point at the end where there's like uh, this woman and she's trying to give her alibi, but the she, her alibi is that she's getting liposuction and she's a workout instructor. Right. So she doesn't want to say, because she wrote Brick's butt buster workout. So she doesn't want to say that she's getting liposuction because she's worried about her brand, right? And so for me as a writer, um, about faith practices at home, I get really nervous that I'm like that person sometimes. And it's like, we're not at home. Like, having these sacred moments like every day, like doing crafts and like creating with, you know, connecting with the Holy Spirit every day, just because I write about it doesn't mean that I'm like uh, living it. No, that doesn't mean that if there's like this huge divorce that like I want to be using, but I always encourage, mm -hmm. look, you know, my whole point is to try and find one moment of connection or one prayer or one, you know, just a few of these things. So I think, um, I think a number of, of our readers are um, ministry leaders or their parents in the church, and they, they use these books and resources to try and connect with their kids spiritual, spiritually. And I, I know that they're interested in like, well, what, what works for you? Like what have, and so you can think back to, you know, when your kids were little or what, even now, I think, um, you know, I'm curious about what, when your children are teenagers, like how do you connect to them spiritually? So I can go first to give us another second to think, but for, for me, one of the things that uh, I have was one of the things that kind of started my whole journey of writing about faith for families is this idea of giving a blessing to children at bedtime in place of a bedtime prayer. So like saying, okay, you know, the parent can just like say, say something and say a blessing. And for me, I'm the type of person that in my habits, I do something for a while and then I put it away and then I pick something else up. Like I'm not the type of person that's like, okay, every morning 6 a.m. I get out my Bible, I do this thing. And then, you know, like, mm, no, sometimes I'm like reading Psalms, sometimes I'm writing, sometimes I'm doing whatever. So that's kind of translated with my kids. Like sometimes we'll do this thing, sometimes we'll do that thing. But with each of my children, there's been a season of life when we've done these bedtime blessings. And with my oldest, who's now nine, he said to me about a year ago, he said, uh, oh, and so when I do the blessing, I say the words, whatever words I want to say. And then I say, uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I do the sign of the cross on their forehead. So my son, Clayton, who's nine said to me about a year ago he said hey mommy do you remember when you used to say some words and then tickle my forehead <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, said, I said oh yeah I do remember that and it was kind of a reminder to me that like uh sometimes the ritual doesn't it doesn't have to necessarily they don't have to necessarily know what it is and so um I sort of took that up again for a little while with him and then started it with my um my three and a half year old. So that's one of the things that's in my book. I don't even do it the way that it's in the book. I usually just say something simple like,
like good night and sweet dreams you know may god bless you and then in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit and my three-year-old uh marina she says that now in the father the son the holy spirit and i was <laughs> doing a little blessing for her doll the other day which is really sweet so i don't know i don't have an order just jump in anybody that has any ideas or stories um for for our family um I would go in different, I'm like you, I would have certain things that would work or that I'd like. And then, um, and I think too, I was, um, to, to some degree, like my husband, uh, was really not interested in like, he, he doesn't feel as comfortable, like doing like family devotions or things like that. And he had some, um, bad experiences, not with his own family of origin, but the church that he grew up in. So things like that are, he's a kind of allergic to a lot of um, things that mm -hmm. feel um, kind of evangelical or right. something like that. Um, so we're Episcopalian and our faith practices as a family were um, to go to church together and our church was always and is always uh, really looking at like um, enter the great conversation, you know, what are the questions around this and embracing mystery and, and those things. And so I think I did a lot less than some of my friends who are also Christian moms. I probably did a lot less of kind of like teaching or making a, um, making a point of, of teaching. Now I would say a prayer for them before they went to sleep. We would sing, uh, we had a little song of grace that we would sing together as a family and it was just you know god is grace and god is good i won't sing it for you because i'm not a singer but um uh, uh, uh all right well it was god is grace and god is good we do thank him for our fruit and that was Aww, sweet so things like that so i guess i was really focused on gratitude on um i think i would point out to them beautiful things in nature. That's always been sort of a thing. And I would say, oh, wow, look at that. And not necessarily make it overtly spiritual, but kind of um, help them to notice things like that and to notice beauty. Um, and it was really meaningful to me uh, to have them all when they were all home. <laughs> Mine are 24. My oldest lives in California and I live outside of Chicago. Um, and then 24, 22, 20, and 18. So now, you know, I go to church just with the one child um, and everyone else is, is usually in college or out um, in their lives. Um, but it was always really meaningful to me when we would all sit together and then go up for the Eucharist and kneel together. And I feel like that experience um, was very bonding for us in a way. And there were times in my life where I would think, oh, I'm not doing enough, you know, I'm not reading the Bible to them every day or doing the things, and I would have these little messages that would occasionally like prick my conscience and go like, am I doing enough? But then I realized really in our liturgy, they were exposed to scripture and memorized it in the context of the prayers and the confession and the things that we've done. And it is a part of them, you know, it's, 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 in the fabric of who they are. And so I, I now feel really happy about the way that we did our, um, our kind of spiritual parenting or whatever in that I think we were models of faithfulness in terms of um, how we were trying to spend our money or how we were trying to treat other people or how we were trying to um, live in a faithful way. Um, but yeah, we didn't, I wouldn't say like we had um yeah like a plan <laughs> you know like a strategy yeah. you know yeah. i don't know if that answers the question it totally does <laughs> yeah i think yeah. so i think people i think we that's really reassuring to me as you know in the middle of it like okay you know um you don't we we just kind of do all these things as we go along right and and trust that god works in in each of their lives in ways that we won't necessarily see or know or um, predict, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, I and I mean, the way I guess the thing I really do every day is I pray for them a lot, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, and trust God to care for them and to, 
mm-hmm. to help them to relate to the world in a certain way, you know, yeah. because of their um, upbringing and because of God's work in their lives. And yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I think great. one of the challenges, maybe you guys see this too, is, you know, for the most part, my kids have grown up seeing me as a professional Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I work in a church. Um, I write books about faith. I go out, you know, they would hear me practicing my talks that I'd be, you know, giving people and stuff. And um, so part of it is just that weird thing that kids have then. I mean, I think they know it's personal for me too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think one of the best things that I've tried to do is just, so I guess in light of that is I'm, pretty open like nothing shocks me and Mm -hmm. we've always just encouraged big questions and never you know if one of my kids you know which I think they probably all have at different times you know been like yeah I don't know about this God thing I don't know Mm -hmm. if God is real and Mm -hmm. just not that's not something that's going to phase me I mean sometimes I'm kind of mean and I'm like well you're baptized so (laughs) (laughs) too bad God's got you whether you believe it or not I have actually said Mm -hmm. that to them but anyway no but like um I think that that's just creating an environment where it, the kids know it's okay, you know, mm-hmm. that it's okay to explore. I want their faith to be um, mm-hmm. their own. They're, they're not going to just, um, you know, we've had little family devotional times here and there. We've always been bad at that. And certainly I prayed um, mm-hmm. with them and I pray for them all the time, but I don't want them to, to think that, that I am just like teaching mm-hmm. them this stuff in, in some kind of, professional way or something yes. so um yeah that's kind of it and, it, and it's fun to see because each of my kids um have the faith it mm-hmm. looks very different and I like seeing how it changes and how it will change to mm-hmm. the older they get um and what that looks like and how that's lived out so mm-hmm. um but yeah as far as practices we usually have um right now I'm thinking it's been up for probably two years now, but you know, I'll do a little thing where I'll, I'll print up a Bible verse and stick it by the back door, just kind of surreptitiously. And Uh um, I don't know that anyone ever reads it, but (laughs) you'll find out and find out, you know, but yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. That's great. I think too, you know, it's, it's that thing of not wanting. I remember when, when I had my first child, um, I just had that feeling like I don't want to burden this person (laughs) with, you know, I had this image in my head of like a backpack full of big stones, you know, like I don't want this person to grow up in my home and go to college at 18 and have to then unpack all these toxic messages or wounds or whatever. I don't want to be abusive in any way to this person. Like I want to, nurture this person. I want to um, give him opportunities to grow and mature and Mm -hmm. create and all that. And so I I think I've always been really super careful about um, what messages about God I wanted to give and about a lot of things. I mean, and it did, I felt a sense of accomplishment and real joy actually when he went to college because I thought, okay, you know, I wasn't obviously a perfect mom, no one is, but I'm not sending this person off with all this stuff that he's going to have to work through, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and he gets to just kind of fly and not, um, not, not have to, yeah, just like Mm -hmm. revisit all these wounds and, you know, so it's such a huge responsibility, obviously, Mm -hmm. to be a parent and, yeah. How about you, Glennis? Anything to add to the pot? It's okay if there's not. Well, Tracy, when you were talking about um, how you spent some time, you know, blessing your children, um, Mm -hmm. I've often wondered, like, I wish I'd have thought of that when my kids were little, when Mm -hmm. they were growing up. I just Mm -hmm. love that idea of um, them hearing those repeated words, you are a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Mm -hmm. that is precious, precious. Mm -hmm. Um, but so when my kids were little, I don't know, there wasn't, it just seems like, yeah, of course they had like children's Bibles. I mean, I'm married to a pastor. So Mm -hmm. our whole, their whole lives were immersed in the life of the church. And sometimes that can be hard on kids. You know, it's hard on families, um, because you don't want to be so immersed in your work. Like Karen, you were saying about a professional Christian, 
you don't want to be so immersed in your work and so anxious to teach other people or, or, or nurture other people toward God that you neglect your own kids, you know, and they're mm. the ones that see all your flaws, right? You know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <Yes>. so <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a hard balance. But when my kids were little, um, there didn't seem to be like the lovely picture books or board books that there are now, you know, I mean, I, I'm old. So this is like now, 1980s. I had my kids and, so I do think it's wonderful for parents now that there's all this plethora of mm -hmm. wonderful resources. And um, I just think you have to be careful about choosing the right mm -hmm. ones and so that you want to nurture your kids um, the right way. Like, you know, like Jennifer was saying, you don't want to damage your kids or give them any uh, images of God that mm -hmm. they're going to really sort of question later. So Mm -hmm. But anyway, that whole blessing thing mm -hmm. is something that I kind of do with my grandchildren now because mm -hmm. I, I never thought about doing it with my own kids. I mm -hmm. think, well, I'm, I'm going to do it with my grandchildren. And I have to be careful because even though my kids were raised in this Christian home and their dad's a pastor and I write Christian children's books, um, mm -hmm. one of my sons is quite a staunch atheist, him and his wife. Mm -hmm. and with two little grandsons and at first that was a heartache for me but I'm okay with it now they're wonderful people and I love them and they love me and I don't want anything to get in the way and so we just sort of agreed we believe in God and they don't and it's fine it's mm -hmm. okay and so my little grandsons um well, they're nine and six now. So mm -hmm. the nine-year-old, especially when, when I see him, he'll, we have great conversations now, you know, and he'll say, well, you know that we don't believe in God, grandma, right? We, we believe in science. And I say, I know it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> like, can't believe in science and God. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You know, but now I can say, well, you know, you can figure that out as you grow up. You talk mm -hmm. to people, you read books, you, you know that me and granddad believe in God and your parents don't, and you, you must figure it out for yourself, you know? But so when I, but I do say to them, do you want your blessing? You know, like if they have a sleepover and, and they always do. Uh, but I just don't say the God piece. I just mm -hmm. say, you are a blessing and I love you. You know, and I do a little heart on the forehead instead of a cross mm -hmm. or whatever. Sweet. You know, because I just want to be careful about my relationship with them. And um, mm -hmm. so... I love all the resources that are coming out now, like Beaming Books, and mm -hmm. that, that are much more liberal and open and inclusive and all those things um, so that you can nurture kids um, and, and encourage that wonder, Jennifer. You know, so you're not teaching mm -hmm. them, you're not pushing mm -hmm. God, but you're, mm -hmm. you're letting the spirit work in their mm -hmm. lives, you know. And there are a lot more for, you know, for the people who follow Tracy, your newsletters and your work, there are so many more resources than when my kids were little in terms of right. things that, you know, I wasn't comfortable sharing a lot of um, Christian material with them because mm. there were just images about God or about what it means to be a person of faith that I didn't, I didn't want those images and messages to be formative in their lives. But um, increasingly, you know, including of course with beaming books, which, you know, we all love. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many progressive resources that are safe, you know, yeah. and if you're a progressive yeah. person of faith and, and you, you think, is there a place for me? Is there a place that I can find work that will be safe and not offensive and inclusive and, you know, all the things that are values to you, there are things like that. And um, church publishing who's doing a little blue bottle has wonderful resources for families and they have children's books that um, would be appropriate for progressive Christians, you know, and obviously beaming books and, you know, a number of others. And uh, I'm interested and I've thought about this in like creating like a list and I know different places mm -hmm. have, a, have mm -hmm. lists, but I think that um, people in children's ministry who are Episcopalian or mainline or mm -hmm. um, more progressive in their um, social values and so on, they, 
you know, we're hungry for those things, you know, yes. and, and it was really hard when my kids were little because I wanted to encourage spiritual curiosity and wonder, but I also didn't want to say this is, this is what being a Christian must mm. look like, you know, and these people are out and we're in or, you know, any of that mm. kind of stuff. Um, but I'm encouraged that there's so much more, you know, yeah. yeah. I was going to say too, Tracy, one of the things that I appreciate about the work you do and your projects is that, um, I'm going to use the word simple and I mean it in the mm. best way, but yes. I really yeah. do appreciate the simplicity of that yeah. because I think, the other thing that can happen is we get resources and it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And it's this huge right. yeah. project and we're going to commit mm -hmm. to this. And right. mm -hmm. um, I think that's what feels so self-defeating all the right. time, but just yeah. um, kind of simple ways and, and tools to give parents and families mm -hmm. to be like, it doesn't yeah. need to be some big program. It doesn't need that your kids need to sit still for 20 minutes after dinner. So right. you can read through this right. and all that stuff is great if that works in some family cultures, but just, little hints and little ways of, of just even, you know, generating conversation, you know, and, and yes. getting a safe place for, for discussion and um, mm -hmm. just little ways to notice the spirit, to, to see God in nature, whatever those things are. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. I think that really, that leads into how I, I thought we could end our time. We're getting to Sadly, the end of our, our time, we could talk for hours, I'm sure. But I, I was thinking as everybody was talking, you know, a lot of the people listening might be people that have many hats, or even if if they didn't before, they do now, you know, yeah, that's time, true. Like everybody is like, you know, teacher. A cruise <laughs> director, a teacher, a, mm -hmm. you know, trying to battle their own wellness. And then I was also thinking, you know, whether it's around parenting or writing, like all of us have sort of shared, or, you know, through this conversation, or if not in this one and other times in our, our gathering together, like I, I think all of us have had these times where it's like, well, who am I to say these things or who, you know, um, who just a crisis of confidence or a crisis of, and I think that that's something that everybody is feeling some of us right now. So maybe we should end with, you know, what, what has gotten us through in those moments when we've felt like, who am I that I should, <laughs> that I should write these things, you know, and all of the prophets feel that and all of the parents and um, what kind of encouragement do you have? And I think, I'll, I can start the the thing that I was thinking about and that I, I talk about a lot is, you know, before, before we can do all these nice things with our children or before we can start these practices or pick up a book or whatever, the, the first thing really is to pour some time into ourselves and to nurture ourselves a little bit. And for me, some of that is what we're doing right now to find friends and just talk about the things we want to talk about or whether it's, um, you know, eating a salad or going for a walk or whatever it is, um, as, as parents and women, a lot of times we're taught that that's selfish or wrong, but I hope, I hope that just by listening to this conversation, that's been a, uh, a choice that somebody's made to do something nice for themselves and just to affirm that. And, um, is there any other kind of closing words of encouragement to people that might be feeling like weighed down right now? Well, I think uh, for all of us as writers, every time, you know, I've written a parenting book, I've written uh, a book about adoption, I've written stuff about my own, my own story. And I always have that feeling of like, who are you to, to say this, you know, you're an imperfect mom or you're, you know, all those things. But um, I think we can hold like humbly both our expertise and our, our gifts as writers and as people and we can be authentic about, you know, where are the, the shortcomings we have, but not take ourselves so seriously and not take our, um, you know, not be so proud, you know, but instead say, hey, this is, this is what worked for me. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm not always consistent. Um, I heard Brene Brown on her podcast, I think it was on the podcast, say something about how, you know, she is is internationally known as a vulnerability and shame expert. And then she talked about how she didn't want to be vulnerable. And she said, <laughs> I, I know everything about this. I've done tons of research, but the truth is who I am, oh, sorry, who I am is not always um, vulnerable. And so that felt really freeing to me that we can have insights that 
are worth sharing and we can have experiences that are worth um, writing about or talking about that um, it doesn't mean that we're perfect and seamless and made of Teflon or whatever. It just means that we have insights that we've been given to share. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think your comments about self-care are really, really important. Um, and one of the things that I'm learning in this time, in this COVID time is um, not only self-care, but also just being present. You know, I think mm -hmm. um, this has yanked all of us out of looking toward our hoped for futures, our plan, you know, all our plans and here's what we're going to do next month and here's what we're going to do for vacation and here's what, here's this conference that I'm going to go to and all of that, of course, was canceled. And um, I feel like it's an invitation to be really present and mindful and aware of, of, of the people that are around you, of the beauty that's around you. Um, so you know, I, I hope everyone's can, everyone can, you know, practice better self-care, including all of us on this call. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so, and one of the I, ways, you know, we had practiced self-care, the four of us was our dinners, you know, yeah. and, you know, we can't have that right now, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I would just echo that, that it's, it's so important to just be kind to yourself mm -hmm. and, and take care of yourself and I think especially women uh, whether writers or not I think comparison is an awful thing that mm. we you know that that really does rob you joy I mean I know yes. that's a, you know uh, a quote that's used a lot but it's so true um, I think for a lot of moms out there trying to homeschool they're, they're trying to homeschool these kids they never signed up for it they're mm -hmm. it's not their thing they're floundering um mm -hmm. and you know you see these women out there that seem to have it all together you know and wearing right. all these hats and you know they have a, a, a wonderful routine for their kids and they're, they're cooking dinner you know or whatever and uh, and they always look great I don't know and it's just don't compare yourself just be kind to yourself and just do your best and just mm -hmm. love your kids you know mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. loving your kids is more important than teaching them their abcs i mean mm -hmm. it really is and so my heart mm -hmm. does go out to um all those moms right now struggling yeah. and trying exactly. trying to uh, you know that balancing act because mm -hmm. I would be, I just know if I was a, a mom with my four and going through COVID, I would be rubbish at homeschooling. I, I, <laughs> I just would because I'm just a terrible person. I can't stick to routines. You know, I'm just too spontaneous. And so I would be rubbish at it. So um, I just think be kind to yourself and love yourself and love your kids and we'll get through. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And, you know, something I used to say when I would um, talk to parenting groups and people would always say, you know, oh, my neighbor is so great. She makes, you know, her kids Halloween costumes or my other neighbor <laughs> makes all their bread from scratch or yeah. blah, 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 blah. And I, my kid, um, you know, I hate playing Candyland and my neighbor sits there and plays Candyland for 10 hours a day. Yeah. With and the thing that I always tried to say, and I think it was a, um, a word of comfort to parents is that you can start and this is a great way to practice self-care but look at what you really enjoy doing like um if you do enjoy baking bake with your kid and and yeah. they'll learn some math and some <laughs> nutrition yeah. from things like that or if you're you know I, mm -hmm. i've had a number of friends who've got younger kids who really just threw the towel in with the homeschooling this this spring and just said i can't do it but they're yeah. doing other things you know like yeah. Yeah, they'll be fine. If for us as writers, I used to love writing stories with my kids, you know, mm. and, and, you know, do the thing that brings you joy, you know, don't yeah. feel like you've got to do the thing that your neighbor or your sister in law yes. or whoever, right. And, and, uh, and, you know, if they have a year of learning from baking, <laughs> or learning from going on walks to the park and collecting leaves or whatever, I mean, it'll be, be a great okay. year, it'll be a great year, and it'll be okay. And, and I think that is a gift probably that Glennis and I have with having older kids. You know, my oldest is 24. I'm glad for the times I just showed love. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
so many things don't matter. And later, I just know that the love that I gave to my kids planted seeds of a relationship that I, that I enjoy now, you know, and so good luck out there. I feel so much for, because my kids were closely spaced too, and I, I see families dealing with all this stuff, and I can't imagine, I can't yeah. imagine. So yeah. be, be nice to yourselves out there. Yes. <laughs> Karin, do you have any last words for us? Love it. Well, I, you know, I was just thinking a, a part of self-care and then kind of tying it back to your little imposter syndrome thing when we feel like I can't yeah. do this. You know, I was thinking specifically as writers and sort of what Glennis, I loved your three questions that David asked you, yes. you know, but the thing is it does hit us when we sit down to a new project and this kind of overwhelming sense of, oh my goodness, I can't do this. Um, but I have to admit it hits me less the older I get and the more mm -hmm. I do it because I realize if you can answer that question, has God called you to do this? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Then it's like, you need to do that. However, mm -hmm. you also need to learn the tools. Um, yeah. Maybe there are some people who just, you know, magically the Holy Spirit gives them this wonderful gift, but usually when you're called to do something, it means you also need to prepare. So yeah. mm -hmm. um, when we do feel overwhelmed with a project and think I can't do this, you know, that's how, especially with starting out, you know, Jennifer, I know you too, starting out and writing for children, that's way different. You have to go back and kind of learn it and study it and, and work at the craft. So yeah. that's part, I think, of self-care too, that if you really feel like you've been called to whatever it is, um, yeah, work on it, work on that craft and that's right. get good that's at right. it. Right. At least. Mm -hmm. Friends, it's been so fun. I wish we had a big bread basket though and <laughs> big, you know, like juicy whatever to eat or some sort of brulee. But it's been fun <laughs> just to get together and talk. Um, friends, I hope that you've enjoyed listening. Um, we're going to hop off, but then uh, let's have everybody do just maybe 30 seconds of how can people uh, connect with you and find you if they want to learn more about you, uh, website or Twitter or whatever, and um, what you're excited about. Um, let's, Karen, let's have you go first. Let's go backwards. Let's do okay. uh, Karen, then Glennis, then you, Jennifer. So. Okay, so you can find me on my website, which is my name is right down there, um, KarenRiverDenera.com or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those places I am there. Um, and what I'm excited about, um, I have a few new book projects coming up that I've got to get cranking writing on. Um, I have these Helper Hound books that um, actually the day today as we're recording, two of them just came out, two more will come out in December, and then the final two in uh, next August. So I'm excited about that. That's helper hounds. Helper They're hounds. Sweet stories about dogs helping. And what grades are they for? Uh, they are early readers. So first yeah. through, first and second about. First through but they're in chapter format. They're early chapter yes. books. Yeah. <laughs> so right. cute. I love them. Mm -hmm. Let us. Well, just like Karen, you can find me at my name right there, glennisnellis.com. Or I'm so easy to find on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram because I'm the only Glennis Nellis in the world. <laughs> that is amazing. Imagine that. To me, um, one of and, hundreds of Tracy Smith. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you know, my my names rhyme, right? Glennis yeah. Nellis. I never wanted, I love David, but I never wanted that name. But turns out it's a blessing, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> what am I excited about? I'm excited. It's still, it's birthday week for this little baby, okay. <laughs> which is called Grandma Snuggles. So I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to meet Little Mole in, in the next of his stories in October. Um, that's with Beaming Books and it's called Little Mole's Christmas Gift. So it's just um, a little story about kindness and generosity. So that's what I'm excited about. Hooray. And I can be easily found, although like Tracy Smith, Jennifer Grant is a very, very, very common name. And, um, but I'm at jennifergrant.com and on Twitter, Jennifer C. Grant. And I'm excited about the release of A Little Blue Bottle. I can't wait. To, I have, I've seen it obviously like the PDF of it. I can't wait to hold it yeah. in my hand. So mm -hmm. um, that comes out at the end of August, so. Wonderful, great. Well, thank you friends so much. This has been super fun and we'll have to do it again sometime.
Thank you, Tracy. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.